Jennifer Barnes for her uh, great leadership she's had with our confirmation class. Uh, she was the one who came in my office and said, hey Dave, why don't we do it for nine months? I'm like, what? That's a long time. Yeah, that's what I thought. So uh, it's been good. I appreciate her leadership. I also appreciate uh, uh, Joy Antoine and um, Stephanie Ferguson who have come week after week after week on Sunday nights. and helped with our small groups discussion and helped facilitate the class. And then we want to thank Techno Tony for all of his uh, technology work we just saw right there uh, going on the confirmation retreat. Gosh, I, I failed to even remember. Also, I want to thank Renee Rawls, mom and staff member, always there. I uh, appreciate her ministry with that. Um, we'll be looking together at God's Word from... Um, a little bit disorganized here, but this is going to make sense here. From Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 through 27, I want to invite you to go ahead and turn your Bibles. But before we do that, I have asked uh, two gentlemen in our church to uh, come and share very briefly with us. Uh, I said, I want you, you know, I'm going to preach, but I want you to uh, speak. Uh, very recently, Tony Barnes and Greg Green went on a Methodist Retreat uh, its one we do here in the Mobile area. It's done all over the world. Got a walk to Emmaus, and they had an awesome experience, and I asked them if they'd come and share just briefly why you should go too. So, Greg, would you come and share? I wrote mine down. Uh, okay, there was so much I wanted to say. I actually wrote mine down. All right. And it's a Christian retreat. Okay, let's, let's make that perfectly clear, okay? There. Uh, the walk to Emmaus wasn't what I thought it was going to be initially. My sponsor was right. She kept telling me, don't anticipate, just participate. Uh, for me... The, and talking about the walk and that, for me, it was, a, a self, it was kind of a, a self-assessment clinic of my strengths and weak areas in, uh, in my personal and spiritual relationship with God, uh, spreading, spreading the good news and serving God by serving others in the church community and the world. The Mayus Walk gave me the, uh, the insight and tools needed that I needed to grow in all of these areas. I learned that, uh, for me personally, that I was very much in what we call a comfort zone. And uh, by being in a comfort zone, God doesn't expect us to live and be and stay in a comfort zone. We cannot grow uh, spiritually, emotionally, in relationship with Him until, uh, until we kind of step out of that that's where you learn and you grow that's where i think i got my help and i got focused that man i'm really in this comfort zone i can sit back and tell you that in this comfort zone man everything's going good everything's here i feel comfortable doing this and that but this meeting that we went to i realized i'm i'm not growing and that's what god expects us to do to grow with him along our journey. So uh, anyway, through this and being out of that, says, you know, you can learn and grow in faith and service by staying in the comfort zone. The walk to Emmaus taught me about areas, that, again, that I needed to grow and, uh, and be challenged in areas that I needed to be. The bottom line through the whole weekend, what a great weekend of Christian education and spiritual growth. And... Uh, uh, you can be 90 years old. My best friends that I met were both 79 and 81. So I have some new friends. And guess what? They're going to be my new spiritual partners. Okay? And 
I'm going to get to get a lot of wisdom from these guys so we all can grow and uh, challenge you. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you. He said he wasn't going to tell you everything you had on his mind, so y'all can ask him all the questions you want, and I promise you he'll answer them. Well, you forgot to remind me of this during this confirmation retreat because <laughs> I didn't write it down. <laughs> but, uh, yes, it's right off the cuff on this one. Um, if, you, if you go to this um, retreat, expect to be challenged um, as, as, uh, as a spiritual person. Um, you, you, Jennifer uh, prayed for certain things when she went, and then she got challenged with what she needed to be. And I'm the same way. I said, um, please don't give me this. Well, that's what you're going to get. So uh, if, if that's what you're struggling with and you're praying not to have to deal with that, God's going to find a way to make that happen for you at this event in some form or, or fashion. So um, I challenge you, if you're thinking about doing this, um, it's not for the faint at heart. Uh, it, it's for someone who is really wanting to grow their faith, really wanting to understand how their faith works in them and then how they take that faith and put it out into your community, into your world. So if, if that's where you are in your walk with Christ, I really challenge you to, uh, to take the next step and go on this walk. Tony, a uh, unique thing about a walk to Emmaus is uh, you just don't go. You have to have a sponsor. And so uh, if you'd like to go, if the Lord starts speaking to you about that, the first thing you do is ask somebody like Greg or see Jenny, Tony, me, uh, Andrea, Renee, Jennifer. Let's see, they've all been. Yeah, that's everybody's here. And just to ask us about it. Elise, I'm sorry. Uh, it's been a few years since Elise went. Uh, but... That ask, what is this thing? Oh, I'm going to ask, we'll tell you that's through about a little bit more detail than it's a three day spiritual retreat. Uh, you take communion every day. We can get a better answer than that one, but we'd love to tell you. And then we'd love to sponsor you. There'll be a ladies' walk in the fall, another men's walk in March. Um, uh, somebody was just talking to me this week about possibly helping with the men's walk in March, so I know there is one coming up. It's just a great chance. Uh, why am I so excited about Walk to Emmaus? It's just a way for people to understand that the love of God for them. It's a unique way of structuring three days so people can understand how much love God has for a person. We're going to look to Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24 as we think about honoring our veterans I know we're a week ahead, a week out, but uh, I want to go ahead and do this now. I will be out of town next Sunday. Brian McGrew will be do, preaching and sharing toward graduation. And so due to the way the schedule worked out, we have to celebrate our veterans and remember uh, our country and God's call on our country really a week ahead of schedule. Jeremiah chapter 9, God is... Uh, speaking to the people here through the prophet Jeremiah, and it actually begins with a phrase, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strength boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who has something to boast, boast about this, that they have understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who under ex exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. Uh, you've all heard it at some point in your life about how the Bible has influenced the American Revolution and the Founding Fathers in many ways uh, were influenced by the Bible. And a lot of Bible's influence, this is where people, one of the places I've noticed that people get a little bit confused about this. One of the ways that the Bible influenced our founders of our country was this, is they used the Old Testament a lot. And a lot of us don't know the Old Testament very well. Many of these individuals knew the Old Testament very well because in the Old Testament, God sets up his kingdom through a nation. And in the American Revolution, they were 
trying to organize a nation. So the principles that were in the Old Testament about how to um, move into uh, having a nation and being a nation that honors God are more in the Old Testament. This is one of those passages here is where the prophet Jeremiah is preaching to the nation of the southern kingdom. Uh, we call that Judah. And he preaches to the nation through subsequent kings, which this is that great southern phrase, bless his heart. Bless his heart. The kings only got worse. The more <laughs> Jeremiah preached, the longer his preached, the nation only got worse and worse and worse until they went into judgment. And it was almost like Jeremiah had to be the coach that God called to coach a team so he could watch them lose. He was the coach over the team that wouldn't listen to their coach. But that, and I, I, I'm, I honor Jeremiah and his faithfulness to God it shows God's faithfulness to the nation of Israel that he kept a witness before the people even though they never listened. There's a, one of the many stories of the prophets of Jeremiah that the king at the time would hire prophets to come and tell them how the war, the battle was going to go. And they get frustrated with Jeremiah. And the king says, Jeremiah, you always give bad news. And Jeremiah says, yeah, but I'm always right. You can pay those guys, and they tell you you're going to win, and you always lose. It's, 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 a, it's just a crazy st situation plays out. And this is actually early in the ministry, probably during, still during the time of King Josiah, that the people are outwardly right, relig, spiritual, outwardly committed to God, inwardly their hearts. He says, you're not following God. You're only staying away from the idols because the king has told you to. Your hearts love the idols. And say, this is what you really need to build your life upon. And this is true individually, and this is true as a nation. And he says to us, you know, it's so fun to boast about your wisdom, how smart you are. Ever have that feeling where you're the smartest person in the room? There's that hilarious scene in that movie, <laughs> National Treasure, where the computer guy, Riley, all of a sudden, he knows something nobody else in the room knows. And he goes, so this is how you feel all the time. You know, that, that, that great feeling, I'm the smartest person in the room. God says, maybe you are. But don't brag about it. Don't be proud about it. Or you may be the strongest person in the room or the most talented, the most gifted, the most able. Well, that's great, but don't boast about it. Or you might be the wealthiest. And money does create the presence of having a lot of money. It causes power. That's one of the reasons some, pe some people work so hard to have it, because they want that feeling of being in control. God says, well, maybe that's you, but don't boast about that. He says, I want you to boast about no understanding me. And if you understand me, you know I'm a God of kindness, justice, and righteousness. And I want kindness and justice and righteousness to be reflected in all of your life and in your country. So how do we honor our veterans? I set this up on a slide as simple two questions. By being, I got to tighten this. I guess it's missing a rivet. I'm going to tighten the stand. It is driving me crazy. I keep thinking I'm going to drop Tony's iPad on the floor. Because every time I move it, it shakes. Oh, but it never falls. So, yeah, got to do that tomorrow. Uh, but how do we honor our veterans and we appreciate the best citizens of honor? And not just our veterans, all those who've gone before us, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, who carved out a living in this country. And you say, well, I don't want to squander what they've given me. How do you honor them? By being citizens of honor who create a nation of honor. And how do we live in honor? By living according to God's plan for every nation. So for what I'm saying is true about the United States, but it's true about everybody. This is not just a marrow-centric, to use that clever word. This applies to all people of all nations all over the world. 
Um, do you realize we live in a really big world? There's some really big nations out there. Do you, I mean, when I realized this when I was uh, 17 years old, it blew my mind. The United, Nation, the United States is 6% of the world's population. I forgot to look it up. I think it's 325 million is the population in the United States now. That's still only 6% of the people living on this planet right now. It is, to me, that is such a huge thought. And we have a God who loves every one of those billions of people all the same. He doesn't like us better because we're Americans. And he has the same will for us and every nation of the world. So I'm speaking to us because, well, this is the nation we live in. But what I'm sharing is, is universally true of all people. First of all, we need to pursue God's first virtue, mitzpah. Did I leave a letter at? I sure did. I was supposed to uh, have an S in that. Mitzpah. Uh, justice. Psalm 146, verses 7 through 9. God upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those that are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. God rattles off a list here in 146, verses 7 and 9, of groups of people that are at a disadvantage. We've all heard the term marginalized. These are marginalized people or people living in the margins. That means people that maybe for a fault of their own, but you'll many times by no fault of their own, are at a disadvantage. And it says God upholds the cause of those. And what we must do as a people is create a nation that has justice so that people are treated fairly and people are given opportunities. It says the Lord frustrates one group of people, the wicked, the selfish, those that take advantage of others. And so what this verse is saying here is that God is saying, I want you to pursue justice. And if you do that, your nation will prosper. And if you don't, if you pursue exploitation, your nation will fall. Um, it'd be, it's so easy to think of examples in other nations uh, where injustice has reigned and rules and there's corruption and there's graft and there's just all these problems. But for me, I, I, I guess I prefer... First of all, I prefer positive stories, stories that have happy endings. Yeah, I know, I can tell you plenty of stories that don't. But if I'm going to pick one, I'm going to pick, number two, I'm going to pick one uh, that is close to home. Uh, you know, there's some very prosperous cities in Alabama that were once full of corruption and deceit. Um, where I'm from, Southeast Alabama. If you go to downtown Dothan, there is, you, know, you know how it's popular to paint murals on the side of buildings downtown? They've got a mural on one of the buildings in downtown of a riot. I mean, you know, they're going at it with each other. People fighting in the street, for real. And you can tell they're all dressed in 1900. And these are people wearing suits, having a street fight. That's, that's just a, always an interesting, they don't have the thug uniform on there. They're well-dressed folks. That the corruption of the city got called upon them, and they had a huge, I won't tell you the whole story, they had a huge brawl in the streets. Few people were killed, many were hurt. But the leaders of that area decided, you know, we can't keep going on this way. And the good people of the town rose up and did what was right, who created a sense of, Justice, which caused uh, economic growth that has been just mind-blowing over on that part of the state since, well, at least since the Depression. Just been incredible. And 
That's part of the story of my family of migrating to an area out of another poor area of the state of Alabama and finding opportunity and doing well since World War II with my family. And then, though we don't, this is a, a strange thing. Every one of these can be used to exploit people. Justice, righteousness, and kindness. Every one of these can be used, to, if you take it by itself, it can be destructive. I know that sounds weird. Well, justice is good. Well, justice, based on my idea of what's just, can be very wrong. And that's one of the problems that we see in the world today is we have groups of people who want justice for themselves and not justice for other groups living in that country. And God says, no, you have to glue your justice to righteousness. And second, in First Kings, uh, the word is given, how happy your people must be, how happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. L officials, the leaders of the community. Praise the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed on you the throne of Israel, the king, because the Lord's eternal love for Israel. He has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. Everybody sets out to maintain justice. There's never been a revolution, never been a government set up in the world where someone said, hey, I'm doing this so I can exploit all of you and make my family wealthy. Nobody says that. It's always about justice. But how do you find justice? You define justice on righteousness. God's way of seeing that people are going to are gonna love their neighbors yourself. People are going to support each other. You're even going to go as far as love, loving your enemy. Justice and righteousness. But again, justice and righteousness become, can be very cold and very harsh if it's not tempered with kindness. So we have to bring the third virtue together. And Micah 6, 8 is one of those really popular verses like, Psalm 23, 1, John 3, 16. And it's, in the NIV it says, God has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require you to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Actually, the wording is a little bit different. Actually, I should say, he's told you what is good, what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Let me ask you a really pointless rhetorical question. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where, you sh you, where the decision between you and other people and you weren't really sure what was the right thing to do? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. <laughs> so I said it's a pointless rhetorical question. Everybody's had that experience. And I'm, let me go a step further and say, I know myself, I've made some poor choices. For the best of motives. For the best of motives, I've made some really poor choices through the years. I struggle to keep a journal for a number of reasons, and one of them is I sometimes go back and read about things I did, and it hurts me. <laughs> it hurts me when I realize, I, I realize what I did, and why I did it, because I wrote it in my journal. And I, Lord, forgive me. Just Lord, forgive me. But many times, one of the things that can guide us, what is the kind thing to do? What is the most kind way of dealing with these people and dealing in this situation? What is the kind thing to do? A lot of times that will just open a door of quick understanding. Last night, I... Uh, built the slides, and then I had some emails to send. I sent them. So I left the church. It was uh, my office walking home. I guess about, it's about 10 o'clock last night. I got out in the middle of the parking lot, and I heard someone hollering at someone else. I'm by myself. So I look around, look around, can't find anybody. Uh, and I can tell it's in the general direction of Lee Street. So I kind of walk over that way, and a woman walks out past the shrubs, and she's yelling at someone on her cell phone. And so I have to ask myself the question, she ain't seen me yet. Do I walk off or do I walk over? You know? Kindness. And what am I going to say? So I, 
I walked over and said, excuse me, you seem to be having a bad evening. She's like, ah! <laughs> Scared the poor lady to death. Ah! Who are you? <laughs> excuse me, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm Dave Rhodes, I'm the pastor of this church. And I could hear her say on the phone something about, I want to go home. And uh, we've all seen those commercials about domestic violence and that people get trapped and they get mistreated. And I thought, okay, I probably should offer this lady a ride home. And so I say, uh, excuse me, um, you know, could, could I give you, and I won't tell you the whole story. I don't want, and you, I don't, I never got the lady's last name and you may know or you may not, but I, I talked to her and there was one interesting thing in the conversation. I said, hi, I'm Dave Rhodes. I'm the pastor of Chickasaw Methodist Church. You can trust me. I'm not here to harm you. I'll give you a ride home if you need one. And she said, you're the pastor of what church? And I'm standing right there in front of the steeple. I guess this might have, I watched too many movies. I guess I was like, well, that one right there. Chickasaw Methodist Church. I'm like, our church is invisible. Our church, I mean, this is a beautiful, huge building. How can people not see us? And I think, one thing, we love this church because we experience kindness in our midst, between ourselves. And we have to let other people find ways to get a feel for this kindness we share with each other here. Otherwise, we're invisible. Ah, it just blows my mind. But I did, actually, I'm not I might being a little rude, but I pointed to the steeple with both fingers and went, that one, I'm the pastor. Uh, kindness, just what am I supposed to do? Just, for, just pursue kindness. I want to uh, wrap this up here with uh, asking you to look at the back of the dollar bill. If you'd like to, you can take one out and look at it. Uh, by the way, if you've seen the Da Vinci Code, if you've seen the National Treasure movies, those are fun movies. Well, not the Da Vinci Code, it's crazy. Uh, uh, but it's not true, okay? Uh, if, uh, if you've, uh, all due respect to all conspiracy theories, if they were there, we'd already found them. What do we say on the back of our money about ourselves? There's two symbols on the back of a dollar bill on the left-hand side, there is the incomplete pyramid. Um, why is that? Well, it's because our nation is a nation, but it is built to last. Pyramids have been around a really long time. Safe to say, they're some of the oldest structures in the world, built by people. And we build a nation that is to last. We're not a fad. We want to be permanent. But it's not through. It is a nation built on the idea of freedom and justice. And we won't always get it right. But we will seek to get it right. There's a lot of things I really love about the United States and one of those is that the United States has sought to correct its mistakes, its sins against its own people in so many times. Uh, the eye looking at you. I remember as a kid, I used to think that was really, really, really fun that we would have this eye looking at us on this. We have in Greek, anut septus, favor our undertaking. Anut septus, favor our undertaking. That's a question. That's a request. Who are we asking to give us favor? The I, God, the all-knowing God that by his providence, would favor our undertaking. We're asking God to bless us. And there have been a number of uh, historical things in American history that to me show the hand of providence in favor of our nation. For me, the greatest one, one of the greatest ones is that the people who wrote our documents as a, 
nation were people who have such understanding of history, they sought not to make the mistakes other nations had and to create a government that was accountable to the people. Number two, God gave us Abraham Lincoln to correct the three-fifths compromise that had been built into the American system to break us free of slavery. Another leader at that time could have destroyed our country. And then with the Jim Crow laws that followed out of the, after the Civil War, God rose up Martin Luther King Jr. who preached nonviolence but resistance so that the laws would be changed in the 1960s. That is providence, if I've ever seen providence, in the history of a nation. The s nations that have mistreated each other, mistreated groups of people for centuries, are sad and many. But we were able to listen. Novus Ordo Seporium. Let me see, where is that one? Um, um, the new order of the ages. Our, we believe we're creating a new order of the ages called a freely elected government. The number of governments that exist now that a new order for the ages. It's not that we wanted to rule the world, but we wanted to create a form of government that was more fair. No form of government is ever completely fair, but it's more fair because the people have accountability. I went to our great city council meeting uh, Monday night because two of our great ROTC people sitting back there were being honored and I wanted to be there for them. And uh, we had, you could speak and talk about your problems to city council. There were so many of them, Phil so graciously decided, <laughs> some other time, Mayor. <laughs> but I thought it was really great that these people got him criticized our city government. And none of them have been arrested this week. None of them have been harassed. And they just got up and complained. And I thought some of their complaints, don't tell them, were silly. Some of them were serious. Some of them broke my heart. But they were allowed to complain to the government. And if that doesn't work, we have an election in a few years to correct those problems. Let's go to the other side of the uh, dollar bill. E pluribus unum. From many, one. That is our strength that we take a united group of people and we work together. Out of many come one. We don't even pick them. We just show up and we trust that eye on the other side of the dollar bill to providentially help us all work together. And then we have an eagle, symbol of our nation. Thirteen arrows in one claw, olive branch in another. Now we want to be a nation of strength, but a nation of peaceful strength. We don't want to be, uh, and there's been plenty of them, they're still around today, nations that have figured out, hey, if you go to war and you take things from other country, you get rich real fast. But if you don't have a uh, strength, you can become open. To attack. So we have this tension here between strength and peace. And then in English, with all this Latin on the dollar bill, in English we put, in God we trust. Statement of faith. In God we trust. We ask God to take care of us. We ask God to help us out as a nation. And if we honor God and live in justice, righteousness, and kindness, God will be able to bless us and help us as a nation. I got a text here. I think I need to look at it. Okay. Um, and I don't normally have my phone with me, but due to something that went on, I actually, actually, 
I was a, a text from the tree herds. I was afraid Lanita had passed away, but no, she said, that was until she's still hanging in there. What's that? Hazel. Hazel, excuse me. Hazel is, not Carol, Carol, much younger. Hazel is still hanging in there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for uh, those that have served our nation. We, of course, think of our veterans, but also we think of just good people who have lived good lives, that have brought blessings one generation on the next. Help us as a church. We first just want to be a church of Jesus Christ. But we've seen it told time and time again in your word. We've seen it lived out in, in history where there are nations that have strong and healthy churches, where there are communities that have strong and healthy churches, the communities are strong and healthy. As the saying goes, so goes the church, so goes the community, so goes the nation. Help us to live for you so that we can live in your good pleasure. We can please you, but also we can be about promoting goodness, virtue, kindness, and justice in our own society. Lord, help us to pray for our nation and help us to adequately remember and thank those that have been a part of bringing us to this point. In Christ's name we pray, amen. May you go in the peace of God.